Um, and now I'd like to introduce Robert Sheffer. I think I got that right. Um, he's going to talk to us about DNS for you for public anonymization. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Robert and uh, uh, I would like to guide you uh, through our thoughts of, um, on anonymization uh, within the uh, service which uh, we call DNS for you for public. Uh, uh, and um, just, just a very brief introduction on the DNS for EU. Uh, usually the DNS for EU project, uh, which you, you hopefully uh, uh, have heard about to some extent, uh, uh, is understood as only the public uh, DNS resolver. Uh, it's not. Uh, under, the, under the brand of DNS for EU, uh, actually multiple uh, different services uh, slash products uh, are being introduced. So. Uh, we are working uh, and we are already deploying DNS for EU for governments um, and we are working on DNS for EU for telcos as a specialized uh, specialized services and specialized product within the DNS for EU brand. Uh, and uh, uh, the one DNS for EU for public is scheduled for next year. Uh, and uh, the topic of anonymization is actually mostly uh, relevant to DNS for EU for public, which we, which uh, we dedicated, we committed ourselves uh, uh, to keep the DNS for EU for public um, to the uh, great extent of privacy. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, that's an introduction where we are coming from and where uh, why I'm basically asking you today yeah, to challenge uh, me to challenge us. Uh, with our thoughts on how to uh, how to do uh, the anonymization, and uh, uh, looking for a sweet spot yeah, uh, between privacy uh, and security uh, or security research, uh, maybe I should say, uh, because what we do within the consortium uh, that's working on the uh, DNS for EU. Uh, we want and we are committed to the highest possible level of privacy and on the other hand uh, we want to protect the European citizens against uh, against recent uh, malicious campaigns, malware, phishing campaigns, etc. And to do that uh, the consortium members, the researchers, they actually need to work with some kind of data they would like to, uh, they would like to have uh, and you can imagine uh, they would like to have uh, as much logs and as detailed logs as possible. Yeah? So that's, that's, that's the clash between the private DNS resolver and the protective uh, DNS resolver. So, okay, if you want to have a private DNS resolver, uh, the best uh, or uh, the best uh, option is simply don't log anything, right? It's private. Yeah. So why why do you considering why do you even consider logging anything? Yeah, it's because. Uh, we committed ourselves to do the research on top of the data and to identify new malicious campaigns and to protect the European citizens against those. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if we don't lock anything, we cannot do the research. We would be completely blind. Um, and if we lock everything, on the other hand, to uh, provide the researcher uh, as much information as possible, uh, we would actually see uh, quite some amount of personal information. Yeah. So. Another step in this like uh, chain of thoughts may be uh, okay. Uh, so just uh, simply don't log the client IP address on the resolver. Just just drop it. Yeah, just drop it and uh, okay. And you have you have the uh, the information about the queries and do the research on top of that. Yeah, yeah sounds good. But uh, what we have discussed uh, with the with, with the research teams is. Uh, they need to understand the sequences of the DNS queries yeah, to actually uh, be able uh, to come up with uh, significantly better results. Uh, so to have the sequences, yeah, uh, okay, we can simply hash, uh, for example, hash the client IP address. Okay, it's a nonsense. Yeah, it's a, Hashing the IP address is nowhere, uh, just hashing the IP address is nowhere uh, near anonymous or, or private yeah, because uh, the, the the attacker can simply brute force that and and uh, understand what was the source I, original source IP. So another uh, idea, uh, okay. Uh, so let's only keep the first byte of the IP address to see the sequence. Yeah, to see how uh, how how some requests were sent uh, one after each another. 
um, okay, okay, but uh, still uh, probably uh, the data set of uh, multiple IP addresses using the public resolver would be too wide for the research to make it to make it effective. Yeah, it would be the set would be uh, too too wide um, to actually uh, come up with some particular conclusions uh, and. Uh, uh, replace the IP address with token that cannot be brute forced. Uh, yeah, tricky, tricky. So uh, let me uh, let me describe our thoughts, uh, our thoughts on the uh, how we want to do it. Uh, we want uh, to generate an irreversible token for an IP subnet, not for an IP. Change the token every twenty four hours. So not not uh, that. Anyone uh, that no one is able to identify a long-term sequences, the maximum sequence will be 24 hours for each IP address. Uh, and if there are uh, two small data sets for some tokens, we will simply drop them because there is a, there is a risk that someone can actually identify the person uh, behind that particular data set. Okay. How does that work? Uh, to introduce it to the algorithm, uh, the first step is there is a source, the client IP, uh, coming into the logging sequence. For IPv4, we will drop uh, the last 8 bits. Uh, for IPv6, we will drop the last 80 bits. Then we will uh, run it through HMAC, uh, a keyed HMAC, uh, with a key being regenerated every 24 hours. Uh, so that we limit the uh, limit the sequences maximum to 24 hours. The output of this HMAC, uh, we will truncate it to, to only uh, 128 bits. So we will only use uh, the first uh, 128 bits of the output and we'll run it through a different uh, method, through AES, uh, again uh, with a different key and with a unique initialization vector, uh, each of them being generated, regenerated every 24 hours, um, not stored anywhere centrally, only in, uh, kept in memory, uh, so that we minimize the, uh, the risk of uh, leaking uh, this cryptography, uh, cryptographic material. Uh, and again, we will, uh, uh, we will drop, uh, we will drop uh, part uh, of the output uh, we will drop half of the output, uh, and we will use uh, uh, we will uh, we will drop four bytes of the output, uh, the first four bytes, and represent the final string. Uh, represent the final string as an IPv6 uh, address that we can use further on uh, within the logging pipeline, and uh, can be used uh, for the res for the actual research. Uh, purposes. Yeah. So, um, uh, and the final uh, final step in the actual log storage that that's not done real time. It's not done on the resolver itself. It's done in the in the final log storage. Is that wherever we only see less than something like 100 logs per day for the same token, we delete it. We drop it because there is a chance. Uh, that it's a too small data set that can be uh, that, uh, someone behind the data set may be actually identified. Um, an example of uh, how it may how it may look uh, for the uh, uh, IPv4 and IPv6 inputs. Yeah. So first, we drop uh, the last byte for IPv4. Uh, we drop a lot more for IPv6. Then we do uh, the HMAC hashing, the key hashing. Uh, part of the output is running through AES, uh, and part of the output from AES is represented as an IPv6 uh, final final address here. Yeah, so, uh, just to just to sum up, what does it what does it mean? It may not be uh, it not, may not be uh, very obvious. Uh, so, keys and initialization vectors are only kept per individual resolver, not synchronized, in memory. If the resolver crashes, restarts again, uh, new keys, new initialization vectors will be generated. Yeah? And they are regenerated every 24 hours. 
the uh, uh, the locks of individual IPs um, on different resolvers will differ. Yeah, so there will be no, there is no, there is no way how to connect. If your, if, if the same client will ask resolver A and resolver uh, resolver B, the final tokens will be different. Yeah, and uh, uh, we are very confident that these fin final fingerprints are actually irreversible. The only risk that we can see is that the key, uh, the keys would and the initialization vector would leak. In that case, an attacker would be able to brute force the original IP range, not the not the actual IP, uh, but will only be able to attribute uh, the traffic of that IP range to uh, to a sequence of 24 hours, not more. Yeah, so that these are our thoughts how to how to work with the anonymization, and I would be very happy. If you approach me now or later on with your thoughts, with your um, immediate reactions uh, and discussions, um, how you how you see it, what you would change, uh, um, adjust or uh, do in a different way. Uh, I'll be here up until 4 p.m. If you cannot uh, catch up with me, you can also reach out to my colleague Andronikos here. Andronikos, can you please stand up here? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Looking forward to your reactions. Todd with Quad9. The, uh, using 24 hours as your increment is a fairly long duration as far as I would be thinking. Do you see any risk in such a long duration allowing uh, a researcher or someone who has access to that data to reverse engineer the identity of the IP address through the DNS queries themselves versus the IP address? In other words, is there any patterns the longer the pattern, the longer the, the duration, the higher the risk of a pattern itself in the DNS in, in revealing the participant. Have you thought about that direction? Uh, in, in a way that uh, um, the researcher would connect the information from the resolver and from the locks, or uh, or just like looking at the anonymized data, he would be able to attribute it. Right, regardless of the hashing of the IP address, by mm -hmm. having enough data of the query string from a particular <laughs> IP address, you'd be able to say, I can identify, or. It, it, is, it becomes easier to identify the end user. So is 24 hours, was that used, f in other words, would a shorter period of time make more sense to keep that risk at lower, or is that, a, is that, is that <laughs> number just simply variable, or was 24 hours picked for a particular reason? For a particular reason, based on discussion with researchers, yeah, uh, that, was, that was the ground basis. They would like to see even more when we are limited to 24 hours. Uh, what we see as, a, as an advantage here is that the token uh, is not a single IP, it's an IP range, so we can expect a mix of IPs okay. uh, being included, yeah, which gives some headache to the researchers, but gives also the positive edge to the, to the privacy aspect. Thank you. Petr Menshi, Kernet Head. Have you considered uh, using uh, logging uh, DNS cookies and when when incoming packets would not contain, uh, then uh, generating uh, uh, yourself a cookie for that IP address and connecting uh, uh, subsequent uh, queries using cookies? Because th this your approach looks like kind of cookie of sort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we haven't. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, may look into it. Um, it may it may be considered a cookie uh, of sort um, based on like only computational approach, basically on the on the resolver side. Yeah. Thank you very much.